What's going on everyone? Thanks again for joining me today on another one of my Bubble IO tutorials. For today's tutorial, I'm going to be taking you through how to pull data out of the database and display it in your application. Something that at face value sounds pretty easy, but I know from my own experience, it can take a little bit to figure out exactly how to do it properly. There's a few different ways to do it. Some of them are easy, some of them are not so easy. And so I thought, well, why not just spell it out and show you exactly how to do it in today's session. To do this, I'm going to be creating a really simple little concept of posting a message within my application and show you exactly how I do that both at the database level and then how I pull that data through to the user interface from the database. So to get started, we're going to clone one of our pages. I am just going to use my, I think I'll use my buy now page. It's a pretty simple page and I'm going to call this posts. So I'll just tidy up a few of these things first. Let's get rid of that. Uh, we'll get, we'll move this up here because I'm going to need it. We'll get rid of that and we will expand this up. And I'll show you exactly why in a moment. And we will get rid of this as well. So with my page created, I just want to show you a couple of things at the database level first and then we will jump back to the page. So if I go over to the data tab and we go into data types, you can see right now, I only really have one data type, which is user. And I have uh, purchase complete, which was from the previous tutorial, if you've seen that one. And I have a value called first name, um, which is a new value, a new text value in my database. And I'm gonna create a new data type called posts. Now we've got this option here to make this data private by default or non-private. Now by private, it means that it will be attached to the particular user and won't be displayed to other users. So in this particular case, I don't think I want to turn that on by default because I may want to make these posts visible to other users. So you can see there, I've got a new data type now called posts and we're going to create a new field inside that and call it post and we're going to give that a text field type. Now, important point here, this field is a list, multiple entries. Now for something like this, where we want people to be able to essentially post a message and then later on post another message, this is exactly what we want. We want this field to be multi-entry and you will see how that works in the database later on when I pull up the data. So let's create that. Cool. So we have our data type of posts and within posts, we have a list of text called a post. That's all we need for now. So I'm going to jump back now to my design. Now back on my posts page, one of the first things and one of the more simple uh, database connections to do, I want to set up my current user's first name where this placeholder is at the top. So after they log in, it says something like, hi, first name. So I'm just going to double click on this text box that I've got here. You can see I've got some placeholder text there. We're going to get rid of that. And we want to click here. Let me move this across a little bit. Now that we're in here, what we want to do is we want to click insert dynamic data. We want to go to current user and we want to say current user's first name. Easy as that. Now, after the user has logged in, this field will update based on the database to use the current user's first name from that data element that I created before. Now, if we wanted to, we could get a little bit smarter and we could add in a hard coded value beforehand. So we can say, hi, space, current user's first name. And let's just put a little exclamation mark at the end there as well. So now, hi, current user's first name. Awesome, that's pretty straightforward. And we can hit the preview just to make sure that's working. Awesome, there we go. You can see it's pulled my first name. I'm already logged in on this test account, so it knows how to position my name there. 
Awesome. Jumping back to my application, now we're going to start adding a few more advanced functions to get a little bit more smart with how we handle pulling data from the database. So first thing, if I want people to post messages, well, I'm going to have to give them somewhere where they can actually insert a message. To do that, I am going to go down to inputs and I'm going to put a multi-line input within my application. And let's put this little box here and change this to be submit instead. So I've now got a text area where people can come in and actually input whatever their message is going to be. Okay, so now that I've got my multi-line input, I first of all need to connect that back to the database so that when people put text in here, it knows where to store it. So to do that, we're going to double click on here. You can see it's got the placeholder, that's fine. Do we want to limit the number of characters? Let's say yes, we'll follow the, uh, the Twitter style of limiting to a maximum number of 280 characters. This input should not be empty, it's okay, we can leave that on for now. This input is disabled, we'll leave that, that's fine. Element is visible, that's fine. Fixed width is fine for now. And everything else on here is okay for the time being. We don't want any initial content in there, and we do want some placeholder text. Okay, cool. So we've got our multi-line text box ready to go. And now what we want is we want to tie it to the submit button. So if we go into submit, we want to hit start edit workflow. Now it's got some actions that it's copied over from my original duplication. Let's just get rid of those for the time being. Okay, so we're back to just button submit is clicked. So what do we want to do when the button submit is clicked? we want to go in and we want to go down to data and we want to create a new thing. The thing that we want to create is a new post. Now what we also need to do is this is where we need to connect this submit button back to that multi-line input. So we want post and we want add and we want to add if we scroll down to multi-line input A. And we want multi-line input A's value. So now if we follow that process through, when we hit the submit button, it's going to grab the data that's in multi-line input A. We can highlight there, see the little text box. And we want to grab the value that's in multi-line input A. So let's just go back to our design for a second. And let's hit preview. And let's say this is a test. I'm going to hit submit here. Looks like nothing's happened because we haven't told it what to do after that. But that's okay. We'll come back to that in a moment. But if we go over to our data and we go into app data, jump over to all posts, you'll see there we now have this is a test and it is created by my user, which is exactly what we wanted. Jumping back to our design for a minute though, let's finish off that workflow and do it properly. So we want to create a new post, great. But when we create that new post, when they hit enter, we know it's going to store it in the database. So typically when you hit enter in something like Facebook, Twitter, etc., that text then disappears from the input box and appears somewhere else. So we're going to do exactly the same thing. So I'm going to click here and you can see Bubble.io has actually already figured out that because our previous step was an input, our recommended next action is reset relevant inputs, which is exactly what we want. So I'm just going to say reset relevant inputs. So let's jump back again to our design. Let's hit preview. And now let's go test two and hit submit. And this time you can see our text has disappeared, which is once again, exactly what we want. Jumping back to our database, this is now where you can start seeing why we chose multi-line as the text type, because now against this one user and this one database record, 
we have two different values for my original test and my second test that are stored for us to be able to retrieve from the database later on. So now let's do a couple more things just to start rounding this out and making it look more like a real chat messaging system. So jumping back to design. So what I might want to do at this stage now is I actually want people to see the message that they've posted after they've posted it. Now there's a few different ways that we could do this. The simplest way is actually using a repeating group. Uh, I'm going to show you a repeating group uh, in a moment. But I want to make it a little bit more tricky just to show you a couple of other little functions that you may need in your particular application. So to add a little bit of complexity, I am going to bring in another text box. I'm going to put it here. And so the first time I post, I want my message to appear here instead. So much like we did for this high current user's first name, we're going to add a dynamic value into this particular box instead. And we're going to use something a little bit different here. We're going to use do a search for. So we're going to click do a search for posts. And I'm going to jump over here where it says more because what I want to do is I want to use posts last item. And then I want to say I want the last items post. Now we only have one value at the moment in our posts database entry, but we could have multiple fields, which is why we might need to define which last item we want to display. So now once again, if we go out of here and we go to preview, there we have it, test two. The last message that I sent is now displaying in that box exactly what we want. And if I put in test three and hit enter, boom, test three swaps out for test two because test three is the last item or the last post that I have saved to the database. Now back to my application. And like I said, I would show you how to use repeating groups. So that's going to be our next step. I will show you exactly how we can display multiple posts at a time using repeating groups. So let's just say for a moment, great, I've got my text that displays up here for my last post, but I really want to show people a history as well of all their previous posts. Let's save that there and let's add in a repeating group. Now repeating groups are really cool and really powerful. There's a lot of things you can do with them, but they can also get a little bit overwhelming from time to time as well. So as you can see here, I've dropped in this repeating group and you can see it's created a bit of a grid for me. I can pick and choose how many items I want in this grid in terms of number of columns and number of rows. Let's say I want 10 rows. Uh, in fact, let's drop that down a little bit just so it's not too cramped. So I've now got this repeating group here. But if I try and click on here, you'll see it's not really letting me do anything other than pick the type of content, which I will come back to in a moment. So the way repeating groups works is that the first cell, if you think of this like a kind of spreadsheet, is really where the action is happening. We need to add something into this first cell to tell the system what to do with the rest of it. So what I want is I want a text box in this first cell. And if I position this correctly, as you can see, it immediately repeats that text box all the way down the page. Now I have a text box that I can do something with and attach back to the database. So let's jump into our first cell. Now what we want to do in here is we want to insert some more dynamic data. But before we do that, what we will do actually is we're going to set the type of contents for this particular repeating group. Now I already know that ultimately I want posts to sit in here. So I'm going to say I want the type of content to be posts from my database. And I want my data source to do a search for posts. So now if I go back to my first cell, 
and I double click on here, I can go and insert dynamic data and you can see straight away it now picks up, I want current cells posts. So let's do that. And then we want to make sure we go to more and say we want the actual post because we might want the post creator as you saw there. There might be multiple items we want to put in there, but we want the current cell posts and we want the post value from that database entry. So with that done, let's test it out. Awesome. So now you can see there we've got test three, we've got test one, test two, and we've got test three showing up again down the bottom. If I type in here test four and hit submit, then we get the new post added to the bottom and we get the post added to the top here as well. So a couple of things we can tweak just to tidy this up a little bit more. If we click on here and go over to data source, you can see we can adjust the sort by, so I can sort by created date, modified date, etc. I'm going to say created date, and I actually want mine descending, yes, because I want my newer posts at the top and my older posts at the bottom. Once again, quick test, just to make sure that's all working as expected. There we've got it, test four at the top, test three, test two, and my original test. So that's the basics of connecting into the database, but there are a couple of little extra things that I want to show you just so that you're aware of them. Uh, just little nuanced things that um, will come up in situations, particularly where you're using repeating groups like this. The first one relates to the way I set up my data source for this repeating group. Now at the moment, I just have data source as search for posts and I was connecting that directly to the uh, the posts in the database. But as you saw, what ended up happening is I basically end up with my last post twice because I have it up in this top section and then it shows again here, which is not really my intention. My intention was I want my latest post up here and then I want all my history down the bottom. So to fix that is actually pretty easy. We just need to use a function in here. If we go to more, called minus item. There it is, minus item. And then we're just going to do another search. So we're going to do a search for posts, click on the more button, and we want the last item. So now basically what we're saying is we want to, in this box, display our posts minus an item, what is the item we want to minus? We want to minus the very last post that we did. Now if I've done that correctly and we hit preview, what I should see is exactly what is here. I've got test four up the top and I've got test three, test two and my original test as my history. I can confirm that just by doing a fifth test and hitting submit and great. Test five has appeared here and a new entry has been added down the bottom here for test four. Now, one final little thing I wanna show you. If you recall, when I created my post fields, I specifically didn't select that I wanted the values to be private. Now, I did that because I wanted the option later on of choosing whether or not I wanted these fields to be private or public across the application. So right now, basically these items would be posted to anyone and everyone to see. But I don't want people seeing my history. Because this isn't a private field, it would actually mean that if somebody else entered a post, uh, I'd likely see their post here or in my history, which was not my intention either. So we're gonna tidy that up a little bit. To do that, we're going to select our group. We're going to click into uh, the data sources, and we're gonna add a new constraint. The constraint that we want is the created by constraint, and we want created by equals the current user. So now that I've done that, now I will only see my own entries in the history log, 
but I'll actually still see anybody's here. So we're gonna do the same thing again. We click on this first part, search for posts, and add a new constraint, exactly the same as before, created by equals current user. Now, this will be restricted to me only seeing my posts in the history and me seeing my posts up in this initial preview area. So there you have it folks, there's a couple of different ways where you can connect elements on the page into the database and then actually retrieve values from the database to display them inside your application. As you saw, these are very powerful little tools, particularly the repeating group. I really like how it bases everything on the first cell so you can make tweaks and changes. And we can do some really cool things with these repeating groups because of that concept of the first cell. So we might want to grab an icon, for example. I'm just going to shrink this a little bit before I drop it in. And let's put that here. And you'll see, bang, straight away, that icon follows the repeating group. You can do this with images. This is also how you can create a sort of portfolio module because you can have images here, attach those images back to the database and have multiple images display within the group. Uh, and if you have any trouble with that, let me know. I'm more than happy to do a little tutorial on how to create a portfolio style repeating group. But that's it for today, folks. I hope that has been helpful. Please drop a comment on the video if there is anything else that you would like to see, if there's something that you didn't understand in the process that I followed today, or if you just have an idea for a type of tutorial that you'd really like to see within Bubble, I would love to hear it from you. So thanks again everyone and I'll see you at the next tutorial.